I was saying good morning, but it's actually afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, WeShare, for the 2 p.m. start. I love it. Brilliant. Uh, so I'm so excited to be here and to meet you all and hear from you, both speakers and attendees, uh, and collaborate. We really need to do a lot of things together. Uh, so I'm a, a culture hacker. I'm a placemaker, a tactical urbanist. I'm home free. I haven't paid rent for the last four years, and I've been traveling around trying to learn about different crises around the world. Um, it's a... Um, There we go. Huh. Let's see, these went from backwards. You get a little preview. Okay, so now we got all the glitches out. Um, so uh, I work for the Institute for the Future. It's a 49-year-old uh, think tank from Palo Alto that was birthed at the dawn of the internet. Uh, one of our founders, Paul Barron, helped architect uh, packet switching, which is a distributed communications network for resilience, but we're also looking at resilience now in everything, in decision-making, in governance, uh, money, energy, all of these different things. Uh, so that's really the lens which uh, I look to do my work in. And I said before, I'm a placemaker, and I love exploring spaces. One of my favorite places in the world is right here underneath the streets of Paris, the catacombs. It's 220 kilometers of tunnels, and there's all these beautiful art installations, and you don't need any permits, because the whole thing's illegal anyway. Um, and Kristania is the free town in Copenhagen. It's a temporary autonomous zone that's been there for 45 years. Uh, this is a Japanese artist who does the obliteration room. She just builds the tabla rasa, you know, the blank canvas, and allows the users to come in and fill it. And so I like to see what are the conditions which inspire uh, agency and participation. Uh, I also had the pleasure of visiting Republique uh, and seeing Nuit Dubu, which was a very interesting kind of social movement. I'm interested in how these physical spaces can create uh, opportunities for, for people to collaborate and build new things. Uh, part of my work is also going into post-natural disaster zones, because I feel that places that have had crises are really open and new, uh, and are open to brand new ideas, because everything that was there before has kind of crumbled. Um, my own projects in creating spaces, I started with doing an environmental nightclub where we had energy generating dance floor and rooftop beehives and 92% uh, composting and recycling. Uh, and I've also done pop-up spaces, like this was a World Cup uh, screening in Uganda in 2010. Um, and I wanted to start talking about some of the projects that have led me to this work in the National Day of Civic Hacking. This was a... Um, NASA and the White House and 33 government agencies wanted to bring people together in their cities to see how they could improve them. Uh, one of my favorite examples of a non-coding civic hack is called Parking Day. This is by some friends in San Francisco from Rebar that put money in a parking meter, but instead of putting a car there, they put down grass and a park and allowed people to use it. And this is spread all over the world. Um, we found this building that was available for $24,000 a month, but through some clever negotiating, we we're able to get it for $1 for a month. And like all good hackers, we ignored the rules, and instead of National Day, we declared it National Month of Civic Hacking, and we came up with this logo that's just the brackets, and saying, we'll provide the space, what are you going to fill it with? And we were able to take this kind of urban decay, empty building, and in just a few days, transform the outside of it to this beautiful mural park, and we came together on the inside to declare what our principles were. We came up with no money allowed inside, uh, everyone's a participant, and no ego, no logo. And with that, we were able to transform this empty uh, sewing machine factory into a really vibrant community space. People just brought things. Uh, people gave us things, like this truck. We were going to paint free truck on it, but we thought people might steal it. Um, and we had lots of different events. We had 119 events in our first 30 days. So much like the internet of user-generated uh, content, we were doing user-generated physical space. And we were able to... Um, you know, have, have this diversity of events and all these different things happening and change the adage of if you build it, they will come to if they build it, they will stay. And we wound up getting invited to the White House as a new means of civic engagement. Uh, and this was a quote that if, uh, don't worry about when people steal your design work, worry about when they stop. This is from a Barcelona design school. And that was the idea. We inherently have no competitors. We want to see other people do this. So people from all around the world started to ask, how can we do a free space in our community? And we actually wound up doing the second one here in Paris. Uh, Marie wound up running the free space here that was in Canal Saint-Martin. Um, 
We wound up doing now about 20 different spaces in 17 cities around the world, and it was through this work that a little over a year ago, I was invited to try and see if these principles of self-management and providing space could be applied to the refugee crisis. Uh, so I went to Greece last year, and as you know, people, uh, the biggest flow was from Syria and Iraq, and uh, they would come over to the Greek islands, and then they would make their way after they were in the EU, trying to come to Germany and other European countries. But back in February, they shut the Balkan route, and it created this backlog of about 15 to 20,000 people in a place called Idiomini. And I think this is going to go down in history as really exposing the humanitarian industrial complex, I'm calling it, uh, from the inadequacies of being able to deal with the complexity of the situation that currently is facing the world with human migration. Uh, the NGOs, the large NGOs, largely were ineffective. MSF did really heroic work, a French organization, um, but most of the large NGOs were, were not able to adapt to the situation. It was up to individuals, volunteers, who just showed up and started doing really effective work. Uh, when they closed the informal camps, this was the UNHCR's solution, tents in the heat, in the mud. Uh, the government solution was to put tents inside of warehouses. Uh, we decided to do something radical, which shouldn't be, but we asked uh, the refugees how they would want their camp designed. And we were able to find an abandoned space, and we were able to, you know, they said they wanted walls and windows and doors, you know, probably like the type of place that you guys all slept in last night. And we did it with refugee input, with volunteers. This is the number. We had hundreds of volunteers, and you can see more than half of them came from Spain. Um, and we hired local Greek contractors. And we, when we opened the camp, we did it all without any NGOs. Until we opened, we invited in medical and psychosocial to help out, because you can't do that with volunteers and uh, refugees. But on day number two, they were cleaning it themselves. And I walked in and I said, shukran, you know, thank you. And a woman said, why are you thanking me? This is our home. And that's how we knew it was going to work. Uh, lots of different projects came out. Uh, this is what our space looked like. It's a, you know, still a very difficult situation, but we tried to make it as pleasant as it could be. Uh, this is a comparison of, you know, what we built and what the traditional organizations were building. And the crazy thing is we spent less than half of what they spend to build the top with what we built on the bottom. When a, a company gets larger, there's a economies of scale. When an NGO gets larger, for some reason, it's more expensive to do one thing. Um, and don't take my word for it, this is the rating. Uh, they, they scored, the UNHCR scored the 56 official camps in Greece uh, from one to five and they gave us a six. So it's not even on the scale, it was a completely different situation of living situation. Uh, and this isn't just in Greece, this is up in uh, France, in Calais. Uh, and this is a photo by um, a British photographer, and this is one of the uh, tear gas canisters that a refugee turned into a flower pot. And I think we really do need to kind of rethink how we uh, collide, how communities collide in the future is really going to be one of the things that defines this century. Um, there was only 60, 2,000 refugees, migrants in Greece. So after that camp, I really wanted to learn more about the global situation, so I headed to Uganda. Uh, in the north is on the border with South Sudan, which is the most uh, human migration right now is flowing from South Sudan into Uganda. Uh, they're predicting a million people in just this calendar year. Uh, there's also camps in, uh, all over Uganda that's had a very open policy. They even took in refugees during World War II from Poland. Um, and they're allowed to work, they're allowed to move. As far as com uh, countries go, Uganda is one of the best places for refugees. Right now in the world, there are major, major crises, and people are concerned that no one's talking about them. Trump is taking up all the news cycles. Uh, there's four countries that have a possibility of 20 million people starving. Um, this is a camp that I've been visiting in the north called Bidi Bidi. Um, and they're talking about, see, here's all the flow from South Sudan out to these other countries, but most are going into Uganda. And I heard about this place in the news, and I had to go visit. So, and this is a satellite imagery of August 2016 to November of 2016. 300,000 people arrived from nothing to 300,000. That's about the population of Nice. And it's being called one of the largest refugee camps in the world. I'm trying to help rebrand it or rethink it to be called the newest city in the world. There's no infrastructure. They're trucking water in for people. Um, and it's just astounding to see how, uh, how many people can show up at a time. Some days, 17,000 people arrive. And you imagine everyone needs shelter, food, water, a place to go to the bathroom. Um, I started taking some tours of some of these camps. 
but it was really going with the large NGOs. It was kind of like a human safari. You drive around in the white vehicle and you look out the window. So I really wanted to start to get a little deeper. And I met these guys from, Uganda, uh, from uh, Congo. And they built this place out of soda bottles. And it's called Opportunity. It's the combination of opportunity and refugee. And this is where I've been staying. I actually just arrived yesterday. And I've been living inside the camp, outside of the NGO sphere, to kind of really learn what's happening inside these camps and understand the kind of governance structure. So this is Nakivale. This is in the south of Uganda. It's 170,000 people, and it's been there for 59 years. It has uh, people from uh, 12 different nationalities. There's like New Congo is an area. There's Sudan, New Buja, Gambala Village, all of these different towns that are basically, uh, you know, small communities or large communities of refugees that have uh, lived together. Um, this is Kampala, the capital city. There's not a lot of difference. Uh, the villages, the slums are very similar to the refugee camp. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of awareness and kind of attention to the plight of poor Africans right now. There is a lot of attention on refugees, but most of that attention is being paid to refugees in Europe. So I'm looking to try and see how we can focus on the major crises uh, that are facing the human migration. This is an example of uh, one of the villages. This is about 500 people. It's called uh, New Gam uh, Gambala Village, which is an ethnic minority of Ethiopians. It's a very uh, vulnerable community. There's only about three light bulbs in this whole place. Um, but it's a very interesting sample size to be able to prototype some of the things that I think we're going to hear about during this conference. All sorts of things with blockchain, with new models of education, energy distribution. And the chairman is very on board, the community's on board, and the concept is to kind of look at this as one of the communities that we're prototyping. Uh, we're also going to be, uh, have acquired our own land inside of the refugee camp to basically set up a free space. But instead of one building, it's a whole society. And that's the other thing that's really interesting about refugees situations is it's across the board, all things are needed that's present in regular society. It's going to be very difficult to get total, you know, uh, to try things in New York City or Paris, uh, things are generally working here. From here, we're starting from scratch. So that's kind of one of the main points I wanted to introduce, that all of these concepts we're going to hear about during these conference, there's a potential to prototype these in these situations. It's also kind of a bureaucracy-free zone, like a temporary autonomous zone, because there's uh, not a lot of regulation. So the refugees have their own flag now. This was the flag that the uh, refugee Olympic team carried in Rio. And just to give a couple of numbers, the current refugee population, or displaced people in the world, is 65 million. That's about the same number of people in the country of France. There's predictions now that say there will be 300 million in the next 30 years, and some people even think that's low. Um, there are some really inspiring things. I just spent some time with the refugee Olympic team down in Nakavale. Uh, we wound up running a 5K race. The Olympians won, but there were some residents uh, of the camp that did pretty well as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of new ideas of people seeing this again, to look at how we can take some of these ideas. Uh, we share community was part of something called POC, the proof of concept. Uh, and a lot of these different things are possible. Refugees are because of conflict, economic situation, and climate change. So trying to have all sorts of different situations where we can figure out solutions and prototype them in these schools would be great. Uh, another idea, this is Burning Man. It's a 70,000-person uh, temporary city. Uh, but one of the ideas is to do a festival, but instead of taking it down at the end, we leave it in place and it becomes a place for people to live. As there's millions of people flowing into new places, let's try this out and see how it compares cost-wise, quality-wise. Um, there's also, this is a friend of mine in China, has built a 57-story skyscraper that was assembled in 19 days. The population stuck in Greece could technically live inside of this building that was popped up. I'm not saying that's the best solution, but as far as looking at how there's other uh, technologies and new things emerging, I'd like to see that. This, is a, uh, this won the Skyscraper of the Year Award. This is some Polish architects. It's a skyscraper that comes up and is a farm. And then once there's uh, agricultural uh, sustainability in a place, it can be disassembled and put up somewhere else. Um, I've been bringing drones and VR technology into these camps, and it's amazing to see how uh, embracing people are of this, and I could see this being used for new education and curriculum. Unemployment in Uganda is over 80%, so even if they can afford to go to school, they're still winding up uh, you know, not having jobs, so what are the new type of skills people can be learning? And you know, through this time, uh, I'm really kind of, as you hear, 
a little annoyed at the large NGOs. It's not completely their fault. They're underfunded, they're overwhelmed, but structurally, they're built for a different era. So I uh, haven't really talked about this ever publicly. There's only a Facebook group right now, but the concept is called Nongo, and it's just people helping people. It's a disorganization. It sounds like an African word, but it really means no NGO. And the concept is just to have direct people helping people. And that's what I'm hoping to learn about and to help figure out how to set up a disorganization, how to get other people involved to bring their prototypes and their new ideas to these communities that really need it. So I look forward to hanging out with you guys during this week. Thank you very much for listening to me.